in this section of lecture about interpolation, we will talk about splines. So we will describe the principles of spline interpolation. Then we will show how to use spline parameters and how tension and smoothing uh, influence the resulting surface. We will discuss some special cases of interpolation and we will also talk about trivariate interpolation of volumes and uh, topoclimatology. So, splines belong to the class of interpolation methods that, are, that use radial basis functions. These methods are derived using variational approach and this approach is based on minimizing deviations from the given points, so the function either passes exactly through the data points or very close to them, and on minimizing smoothness seminorm, sometimes called roughness penalty. And this smoothness seminorm is a measure of smoothness of the surface, and it is expressed using partial derivatives first, second order, or even higher orders, and they essentially measure the geometry of the resulting surface. And we are trying to minimize the complexity of this surface, minimize its roughness. Advantage of this uh, approach is that it has not only geometrical um, interpretation, but it also has physics-based interpretation. And what the function tries to do is to minimize the bending energy of the interpolation function, which can be interpreted as a thin flexible plate. So we have, we are essentially modeling behavior of thin flexible plate, which has tunable bending energy. And we will show on pictures and animations how this is done. Another advantage of this approach is that it is formally equivalent to universal Krieging. So you can apply geostatistical tools when working with these functions. And the radial basis functions include multiquadrics and splines. And we will use splines to explain the properties of these interpolation methods. So the general equation of spline interpolation methods is our general equation. This means that the interpolation function is a sum of trend and a weighted sum of functions which depend on distance. But the form of this function depends on the choice of smoothness seminorm. So depending on the measure of smoothness or measure of roughness of the surface, we can get different types of splines, and there are many of them. So for example, there is thin plate spline, where the measure of smoothness seminorm includes only second order partial derivatives. Then there is spline with tension that includes first and second order partial derivatives. And then there is a regularized spline with tension, which is a generalized function. And you can essentially reproduce the behavior all, uh, of most of these spline function using just this one. So we will use regularized spline with tension to show the properties of spline functions in general. So what is special about the regular spline with tension? So here, the radial basis function is function of distance, but this distance is rescaled by a parameter that is called tension parameter. And this tension parameter allows us to tune the bending energy of the surface. And what it essentially does, it rescales the distances. So with high tension, 
it stretches the distances which makes the sheet thinner and more flexible. So high tension adds the flexibility to the surface and it can so that it can be rougher. And but this also shortens the range of influence of each point. And you can get similar effects by tuning the range of the influence in Krigging by selecting the properties of your model variogram or by decreasing exponent in inverse distance. So almost all methods uh, have some way to tuning the range of influence, including Krigging, inverse distance, spline, multi-quadrics. And uh, that then influences the resulting shape of the surface. So let's look at how these, how these different shapes will look like. So here we have the uh, surface interpolated from the same input data set with different tension. So the first surface has high tension. That means that there is a short range of influence of each point and the surface behaves like soft rubber sheet and it creates a peak or pit in each data point. So the influence of each data point is over very short distance and then the surface goes rapidly to trend. So you can see that there is a lot of bias towards the given data points. Then this, is, this surface is interpolated with very low tension. That means that the plate is much stiffer and the influence of each data point is rather long range. So the resulting surface will be much smoother. But if we are interpolating with low tension and we are trying to pass through each data point, we can get overshoots. That's why low tension is usually coupled with some smoothing to avoid overshoots. So again, with high tension, we get rough surface. With low tension, we get smooth surface. And usually the best solution is somewhere in between. So here is an animation that shows how tension controls the stiffness of the plate that we are modeling with this spline with tension. So with high tension, it will behave like soft rubber sheet. So that's this moment. And by decreasing the tension, we move to stiff steel plate. So that's this case. And you can see if there, is, if there are very sharp gradients between the points, then the steel plate is too stiff and it can't turn, their, turn around so it overshoots and undershoots. And this tuning of tension is equivalent to range of influence for each point. So with high tension, the range is very short, so you get these narrow spikes. And uh, as the tension decreases, the range increases for each point, and we get smoother surface, but you can get overshoots. That's why we introduce smoothing. And what smoothing allows, a smoothing is a parameter that allows the surface to deviate from measured points. So we say that we are not requiring for the resulting surface to pass exactly through the data points, but in its effort to be smooth, it can deviate from these data points. And addition of smoothing to interpolation methods, reduces overshoots, allows us to smooth out noise, and it also improves numerical stability. So here we have resulting surface with low tension and uniform smoothing, 
But nice thing about smoothing parameter is that we can apply it to individual points. So we can have different smoothing for different points. And you can interpret this smoothing also as a stiffness of these springs. So some points may allow the, the surface to deviate more than some of the other points. So let's say we say this po point is very accurate, so we really want to pass uh, as close to this point as possible. But this point we haven't really measured very accurately, we didn't have very good equi equipment, so we allow much more smoothing for these points. So this is what the effect would be. So we want, for example, to preserve every little detail for points in this area. So we apply lower smoothing to, to these points and we want to make this area really smooth. So we apply higher smoothing. And this is the animation that shows that with smoothing, we are really deviating from the data points. And as the smoothing increases, the surface gets close to the trend. And trend is that surface. You can see it's almost plain. That's with very high smoothing. So you can see that it's, we no more require for the function to pass through the data points. Here we have another two examples of, uh, uh, of spline interpolation. This is the result uh, with spline in old topogrid in ArcGIS, uh, uh, where the default tension was set too high. So you can see that, uh, that there is a little peak around each data point. But what is nice about this tool is that the minimization is solved numerically and that supports carved streams. So you can see that if you have, for example, stream data, you can carve the streams into the DEM and that's useful for some hydrologic applications. Here is the same surface interpolated from same data using lower tension, a little bit higher smoothing, so you don't really see any bias towards the data set. So you don't see these little peaks and pits. Here is an example about influence of, uh, of tension on surface when you are interpolating it from contours. So if you are using high tension and your data are along contours, you will get these artificial steps along the given contours. And again, you can tune your uh, tension and smoothing in such a, such a way so that these artificial steps disappear. And that has... Uh, the, uh, the geometry of the resulting surface can have pretty serious consequences for the results of modeling. So for example, if your tension is set too high when you are interpolating from contours, you get these convex and concave areas, essentially waves along the surface that exactly match the location of contours. And of course, this is artifact. And when you, because for example, the erosion and deposition pattern is dependent on uh, surface shape, you will also get artificial pattern and, arti and uh, wrong prediction of erosion and deposition. So you can see we'll get this cascade of erosion and deposition in this, uh, in this valley happening exactly at one meter step. So again, by tuning the tension, you can change that and you can see you, you can get a nice concave shape of this valley. Now, another important tool uh, when using spline interpolation, but also other interpolations that are dependent on distance, is anisotropy. Anisotropy is useful when you are working with anisotropic geomorph uh, geomorphic features, for example, in landforms in stream bed, 
or uh, or uh, landforms that are influenced by wind. So in this example, we can use different tension in different direction. That means that we are rescaling our distances in different different way or by different parameter in different directions to achieve the anisotropic shape. So for example, here we have some points where we have measured hydraulic conductivity in stream bed. And you can see these black dots are the uh, points where samples were taken. And then the interpolated surface looks like this when standard isotropic interpolation is used. However, we know, for example, that, we, that the maxima are associated with the center of this stream, which is not really quite clear from this map. And we also know that we have some flow influenced uh, features in the stream, so we can apply anisotropy. That means that the distances in this direction or tension in this direction will be different than tension in this direction. And then the resulting interpolation will look like this. So, <clears throat> so the, the shapes are stretched in this direction. And this can be also helpful when working with data that are gathered in anisotropic way. Uh, and you may remember that we talked about profiles taken by real-time kinematic GPS or single beam sonar, where we have very dense points along the profile. And at the same time, these profiles are really far apart. With standard interpolation, this is a really difficult situation. And you can easily create artifacts like these little hills here along the data points and little valleys between the data points. And one way how you can deal with it is to apply anisotropic uh, tension. And that would mean that the distances in this direction will be rescaled. And then, the, then your surface or your beach interpolation will look like this more realistic. So now let's look at trivariate interpolation. So the, the spline functions can be applied as a d-dimensional interpolation. And for, uh, for GIS application or geospatial application, trivariate, maybe four variate would be, uh, would be useful. So the trivariate interpolation applies to endpoints measured in three-dimensional space. And we want to find an interpolation function such so that it passes through these measured points or at least close to them. And similarly, we can define a function uh, in four-dimensional space where we have the points measured in three-dimensional space plus time, and then we will, we will need a four-variate function. These functions are not standard in GIS, but uh, a lot of software for geostatistics or for mining applications support this kind of interpolation. And we also have 3D spline, uh, splines in grass. So this is what the trivariate uh, interpolation can be used for. Here you can see the points uh, are measured in a three-dimensional space. And this particular example is nitrogen concentrations in the Chesapeake Bay measured at different depths. And then when you interpolate it, you interpolate it to three-dimensional grid, and then you can display this three-dimensional grid in different ways. For example, here we have just cross sections. And again, we can use tension to influence the, uh, to influence the volume geometry. So again, with high tension, you can see that the values will be biased towards the points. So for example, here we have a maxima, 
here we have maxima like this all of these are around some given points then as we lower the tension the distances uh, or the range of influence increases so you can see that instead of this local maximum this stretches and again here instead of two local minima we have now one big blob same happens here and if we low, uh, lower tension too much, we start to see overshoots, such as here or here. And you can see that all these maxima are now really, really stretched out. Trivariate interpolation has also a very special application because it can be used for interpolating a two-dimensional grid rather than a volume with influence of third variable. And where do we have su such applications? For example, we want to create a two-dimensional grid that represents the spatial distribution of precipitation with influence of elevation. So, what do we do here? We have some endpoints which are measured in three-dimensional space. That means that we will need the location of the meteorological station uh, in XY, but also its elevation. And then we try to find this trivariate function. So that's same as for, as for the volume interpolation, but instead of computing the entire volume, we are only computing the resulting values at intersection of the DEM surface and precipitation 3D raster or three-dimensional function. So this is how the result will look like. Here we have the, the, the black dots are the, uh, are the stations where the precipitation is measured. And this is the result of bivariate interpolation. And in the mountains, we know that the influence of elevation is pretty strong. So we can incorporate the information about elevation into the interpolation in such a way that we compute the volume model. We use trivariate interpolation to compute the precipitation. And here you can see a, a representation of this volume using isosurfaces. Just, I picked up just two. And then we compute the actual values of the uh, of the precipitation at the intersection of digital elevation model, which is shown here, with this volume model. So it will pick up, for example, the value here or the value here. And then the result will look like this. So you can see that, especially in the mountains, there is much richer structure or much uh, more detailed distribution of the precipitation. And here we zoom into the Asheville area, and you can see that with the bivariate interpolation, uh, the elevation, the topography is practically ignored, and we just get this uh, big blob with very simple geometry. With trivariate interpolation, you can see that it's very dry around Asheville, and as you go up into the mountains, the precipitation actually increases. And here is an example of the exactly same function applied to South America uh, precipitation data. So here is the bivariate uh, interpolation. And the big problem here was that when using the bivariate interpolation, the high rainfall was extended into the Andes where we know that, that it is really, really dry. With trivariate interpolation, we got very realistic result where all the rainfall actually falls as it hits the mountains and it is very, very dry in the mountains themselves. And you can tune how much you want the elevation to influence the resulting surface 
by tuning the Z scale. And so, the, so here at the beginning, the influence of topography is very low. And as we tune the Z scale, the influence of elevation just gets carved into the result. 